This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studio, this is The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm Christy Wright, and joining me today is my good friend, George Camel, and we are here for you. We're taking your calls about money as always, but if you want to talk about starting a business, y'all know I love to talk about that, love to help you with that. I've done that for years. Of course, if you want to talk about time management, life balance, we are on a kick with that this week with the launch of my new book, Take Back Your Time, and if you want to just talk about anything in your life that you need some extra advice on, George and I can be a sounding board for you. We can think it through with you, help you look at your options, give us a call, 888-825-5225. George, one of the things I love about hosting the show, especially with other Ramsey personalities, is sometimes it just takes another perspective that helps people figure out what they need to do. Sometimes we give them advice and say, hey, you should do this. Sometimes we just show them their options and they go, oh, wow, I didn't realize I had so many options. Yeah, it is shocking how many calls are just people needing a little bit of that validation and encouragement that they should do that. They should step into that thing. They should pay off the debt or sell the car because there's so many voices in the world. There's social media and the headlines and our our broke friends and our in-laws. And there's so much you're like, I don't know what to do. And so to have someone uh, you can trust, I mean, we are a trusted brand here at Ramsey and we try to give as good of advice as we can give to steer people in the right direction. Yeah. And it's all stuff that we um, we not only know with our head and our heart, this is stuff y'all that we live out. So from the financial principles to the time management principles to the personal development principles. Um, These are things that we believe we have decades of experience in, and we also really try to practice in our own lives. So give us a call, 888-825-5225. George, one of the things that I've noticed when we get calls here is um, sometimes someone will call in and they ask the question as if they have only two bad options. Like, well, I can stay in my full-time job that I hate, or I can quit my job and make no money. So what should I do? I'm like, well, I don't know. a rock and a hard place, Christy. I feel like you have more options than that. Yeah. And I know you see this on the money side of things. People will make excuses like, oh, well, I've got to keep the credit card because of this. Or, oh, my only option. I love this one. My only option is to take out a loan Mm -hmm. to start this business or buy this vehicle, whatever. And so um, it's one of the things we love to do. We love to help people see their options. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of times you get in your head and you just go, well, I painted myself in a corner here. And I don't have a way out. And I love helping people see that way out. I know you do too. uh, And I love to do it on the money side. And the stuff you're doing with this new book, I mean, just seeing the the reviews come in and people are going, oh, this isn't just another productivity book. Yeah. This actually can help me live the life that I want to live. Yeah. Well, if you guys have noticed from listening to The Ramsey Show for years, whether you were listening to Dave Ramsey himself or any of us Ramsey personalities, we don't just stay at the surface of the question or the problem or the issue. We like to get to the issue below the issue, the root of it and help you solve it there. And that's true for money. It's true with balance. It's true with anything. So give us a call, 888-825-5225. George and I are here for you and we want to talk about what you want to talk about. So we're going to start it off with Stephanie in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Hey, Stephanie, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. What's going on? So um, I have a little small business that I'm, um, I sell about Probably about a year and a half ago, I'm a stay-at-home mom with two crazy, crazy toddlers. And um, it's a custom tumbler business. So I started a year ago, and it took off with a lot of my church and friends. A cu- I'm sorry, a custom uh, what business? A custom tumbler. So okay, I do, it. like, the yep. glitter tumblers. Yep. I, I do those kind of things. Got it. And um, it took off with, with my friends and their friends. So it's been really busy, especially with the season coming up with holidays and starting to get busy again. Um, but I was thinking within probably within a year, I want to kind of extend out. I want to maybe go to some small business brick and mortar stores and put some like what I call ready to sell. So they're not fully custom, but they are like a quick pick me. Oh, it's like, you know, this would be cool for my husband or some stuff, some stuff like that. And to be honest, I'm kind of nervous to step out into maybe going asking a, a small business owner, and I don't know what the steps would be or how to even begin to think about a plan like that. 
Yeah. Well, Steph, oh, Stephanie, here's the one thing I just want to encourage you out of the gate uh, before we even dive into this. There are some aspects of business, and this is true with anyone in business. There are some aspects of business that feel so intimidating and so overwhelming, like, oh, there must be some really sophisticated process and you have to go through 47 steps and you have to fill out 500 pieces of paperwork to get your products in stores. And here's the thing I want to remind you, Stephanie, those people that own those stores they're small business owners just like you. They're human beings. Yeah. And so the yeah. skills you need to get your products in stores are the skills you already have. Relationship okay. skills. So it's actually okay. going to look much more simple than you may have in your head. It might look okay. like getting a cup of coffee and showing up with some samples and saying, hey, I just want to bring you guys some coffee. I think we have the same target market. I'd love to um, set up some time with you guys to maybe explore. Do you have any needs in this area? Or, you know, I, I do some custom work. Do you have any quotes that really sell well on your pillows that I could put on a tumbler? Because I can customize these for you. And you're really speaking to what's in it for them. What's in it for them is they want to sell products. And so if your product is good fit for their audience, then they're going to listen. But it really comes down to relationship building. And, um, and so I think if you do that, and it can be as literally as simple and scrappy as getting some coffee and donuts and bringing some samples oh. to that store. George, what do you have? To, you know, what, jump in, in here on this thing, because I think this is sometimes we overcomplicate things, whether yeah. it's with business or money, we overcomplicate it. It really can be simple. You can make this a very natural process by just knowing these stores inside out. Yeah. Shop there buy something and say, hey, you know, I noticed that there's this opportunity. You guys don't have these tumblers. And I, I actually make them and we're both local business owners. I don't know if there's a way we could partner together to make this happen. And I think you're going to find that most people are going to be receptive to it or you're going to get really good at being told no. And that's great. Yeah. You're going to build that muscle <laughs> where they go, uh, not necessarily. We don't really need that right now. And you go, okay, great. You know, some people listening may not know this, George. I just want to highlight this for them. You started out in marketing here. You worked in the marketing department on Business Boutique back in the day. And so, you know, we, one, you and I have talked about this before, even kind of offline. But one of the things you need to know in marketing your business, which you probably know, Stephanie, in your business, is who your target market is, who your ideal yeah. customer is. You want to translate that to your bus the businesses you're going after, too. Who are your ideal businesses? Who's your target market in the business to business space and find those sweet spots where there's a, a natural connection. George, how would you, how would you help Stephanie thinking through what are those businesses that fit that criteria that would be a natural fit for the product? Well, anywhere that's selling those kind of home goods, uh, kind of products or is, a, is a great start. And as you were talking about these tumblers, I was like, uh, I would go to companies because they're making branded tumblers all the time. We buy, you know, a million Yetis a year that have the Ramsey logo on it. So even going to these businesses and saying, hey, for your staff, I'd love to make a tumbler that you guys can use that you can sell for your store that has your logo on it. Here's what it looks like. And you know what would really shock them? You bring them a sample that already has their logo on it and you give them to them for free. Yeah, I love that. And, and, and play on that uh, custom piece too, Stephanie. You can play on that custom piece where maybe you pick one thing that the store owner likes, but then you make a ton of them. You you know, in bulk that you sell there. But uh, I think if you get scrappy, you will uh, you will find it is actually easier than you think. Stay on the line and I will have our team give you a ticket to our business boutique conference live stream. If you want to come to Nashville, you can. If not, watch us on live stream. It's October 14th through the 16th. We'll be talking about things just like that. How to get your products in stores, how to grow your business. Business boutique conference. Stephanie, we'll see you there. This is The Ramsey Show. On baby step number one, eh? How'd you guess? With health care costs rising, learn how Christian Healthcare Ministries can help you make the most out of your budget. Visit chministries.org slash budget. Don't worry, it's worth it. I'm 
Christy Wright, and joining me today is my good friend, George Camel, fellow Ramsey personality, finance expert, and also host of the Fine Print Podcast, which I'm a huge fan of, partially because I don't like the fine print of things. I'm not a person that reads instruction manuals. I don't like details. I, I can't tell you how many times I've ordered something on Amazon, and it comes in like a ridiculously wrong size just because I didn't pay attention like, to the dimensions. Oh, it my was husband, a child size. Perfect. <laughs> my husband's like, I one time ordered um, a small bottle cooler for my son to go to daycare. This was years ago, and it came, and it's like the size of a giant picnic basket for our entire neighborhood. So, you Yikes. know, I, I appreciate you and the fine print, George, because you're really shining a light onto these unknowns in the finance industry, you're, you're calling out lies, myths, um, and really helping the consumer, the end person that is being misled um, by a lot of these marketing plays from finance companies, credit card companies, and so on, that are getting them in trouble. And, um, you know, here at our company, we are so big on uh, educating you and helping you and giving hope to you. One area we do that a lot with is um, the student loan crisis. And we've got some exciting news coming out soon about that. But I was fascinated as I've, I've heard from our team on that, on just how misled these college students are. Oh, they, yeah. they wake up at 24. They're like, oh, you mean I have to pay this back? Or, oh, I, I didn't know this was my responsibility. It really felt like free money. And gosh, the work that you're doing and everything you do, George, but especially with the fine print, is just helping people see before they make those mistakes, which I think is so powerful. What's the latest episode that dropped this week? The latest one is about the housing gold rush. Is oh. now the worst time to buy a house? That is kind of the question we ask. What's the answer? Uh, you don't want to know. The answer, <laughs> the, here's, the, here's the short answer, Christy. Uh, I'll tease this. I'm very generous, but I do want you to go listen to the episode. Sure. Um, the answer is, it doesn't matter what the market's doing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the headlines say. It matters what your bank account says. Ooh. Are you financially ready to take on a house? I don't care about the interest rates and the supply. Can you afford the mortgage? Is it going to tank your budget? And so that's really what we dive into. We talked to Brian Buffini, who's a real estate expert, industry analyst. He trains thousands and thousands of coaches and real estate um, experts across the country. We talked to our friend, Rachel Cruz, mm -hmm. uh, who had a lot of wisdom about the stoplights, the green lights when it comes to how do you know if you're ready? How do you do it the right way? And we hear from a guy who went through a foreclosure back in the last bubble. And he's saying it feels a lot similar. Now, wow. I don't think there's a bubble happening. We've talked about this on the show. But I do think there's going to be a lot of people who jump into a house too soon. They buy too much house. They waive inspections. They waive appraisals. They're doing things the wrong way because they're so excited and nervous and anxious about the housing market. Yeah, the, it's the the desperate decisions or, or almost like adrenaline type of decisions and those end up being bad decisions. And I love how you said that it doesn't matter what the housing market's doing, it matters what your bank account is doing. And we get calls on the show all the time. They're like, well, should I buy a house now because interest rates are low or should I, you know, buy a, buy a car now because, you know, whatever, I can get a good deal and they don't have the money. So it doesn't really matter what interest rates are doing doesn't matter what the good deal you can get on a car. If you don't have the money, it's a bad idea. So I just, I love how we, we bring it back to the basics, guys. We bring it back to the basics. We keep it simple, common sense. It's not flashy. It's not like, Ooh, wow, this new thing, but it, it actually works and it's worked for over 30 years. And, um, and I love that you are just keeping it simple and reminding people, Hey, what matters most is what's going on in your bank account. Yep. Which is valid. That's hard news. That's right. You got to look in the mirror. That's right. You're like, dang it. I wanted to buy a house. Oh, now's not the time. All right. Let's go to Lena in Indianapolis, Indiana. Hey, Lena, how are you? I'm good. And yourself? Good. What's going on? Um, I have a question as far as the budget went, just, like, where do I stick that money? Obviously, a savings, but like, do I actually use like my savings account or? Yeah, so you're I just saying know. you're just saying when you, for your emergency fund, you're asking what type of account to put that in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few good options here. Uh, is this baby step three we're talking about? Your fully funded emergency fund. No, I'm talking about the first one. Okay, the first one. Yeah, you can park that in just a savings account. It can be connected to your checking account. Uh, you can also put it in a money market account. Those You can find those with almost any bank. 
or you can put it in a high yield savings account. So like I have mine in an online bank that's high yield savings and high yield is a very generous word. You're going to get maximum <laughs> a half a percent on this money. But the point is it's not an investment. This is insurance for life to protect you right now, especially as you're paying off debt. And so you can just park it in that savings account. There's nothing wrong with doing that. A thousand dollars at a half percent. I mean, it's going to be pocket change, uh, but you do want to make it somewhere that you can access easily that is liquid and that's secure. And so I don't want it in the underwear drawer. I do want it in a bank. And so okay. that's going to that's going to that. help you out. <laughs> that was part of it. Now, do do you think that it's possible? I I I am so nervous just because um, my husband makes a 100,000 a year, but we only see obviously after taxes and other stuff, we only see 50 53,000. Is that Am I in the right track? Is this possible? Is it possible to pay off debt? Well, pay off debt and do all the baby steps. Absolutely. There's people who call in who make $30,000 and they stand on our stage and say they're debt free. And so it really is not about income. And uh, a lot of people think, well, I just don't make enough, Christy. We'd get out of debt, but we just don't make enough money. The truth is, whatever you can do to control the money you do have coming in, that is what's going to set you up for success. So I want you guys, I mean, you make a great, $100,000 is an incredible amount of money. I do wonder where it's all going if you're only taking home 50%. The, the, the tax numbers on that don't seem right to me. Yeah. Lena, do you have someone helping you with your taxes? Um, well, I have someone that does my taxes. Okay. I, I'd look into that. I'd look into that. Um, that does those numbers. I'm not a tax pro, nor is George that I know of. But those numbers don't sound right to us. That's not that. Are that, there other things coming out like yeah. uh, investments or healthcare well, I costs? Know, I'm sorry. I know that he pays to like into his 401k, and he also has um, child support that comes out of the check. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Before it ever gets to you guys, those things are coming out. Yes. That okay. So basically, it is two thousand two hundred twice a month. That's like, and I never. This is one thing I never count the hundred thousand because that's not what we see. Right. So technically, what we do see is only the fifty-three thousand. Yep. Sure. That's I, that, like that makes more sense, please. Lena. Here's what I want you to do. Um, George is exactly right that you can do this on that income. It's a great income, even though you do have more coming out off the top. But the reason it feels impossible is because you can't see where it's going right now. So I want you to get on an every dollar budget where you give every dollar a name. And if you'll stay on the line, I'll have Jenna give you a um, subscription to Ramsey Plus for a year. This is what George and I recommend to help you manage your money. We're going to give you the Financial Peace University class to teach you how you can do this on any income, even if that means you take some side gigs to get your income up. But really, when you can see it on paper, that's when you can see how it's possible. Right now, it doesn't feel possible because you don't know where anything's going. And even though you're only taking home 53, that's still a good income. But what it means is you're going to have to lower your expenses to where you've got margin between that 53 and what's going out the door with your bill so that you've got this extra to pay onto your debt, to, to build that emergency fund, pay on your debt, and then, and then build the three to six months. And I think the m months, and I think, George, one of the things people think, just like you said, is, oh, I need more money. You may need a bigger shovel, but you might need to cut your expenses back and change your lifestyle in order to have that margin to put that towards your debt. Yeah. And I, I heard something that was a little bit of a red flag there, uh, and it's investing. Mm. They're investing while they're trying to pay off oh, this yep. debt, and there's a lot going that. on here. So if you want some of that money back, Lena, what I would do is look uh, to see if you're getting a refund check from your taxes. If you are, that means we need to dial back our, our tax withholdings uh, with your employer to make sure that money is going to you instead of to the government interest-free all year. So that's going to help you get some money back if you are getting a refund. And on top of that, I would encourage you guys to pause investing and I know it's going to hurt. And you're going, oh, my gosh, why would you tell me to do that? It's a financial show. You want me to not invest? Yes, temporarily, so that you have more money to pay off this debt, which is going to get you back to investing way more than you were before. And when you watch the videos in this class, Lena, and Ram uh, Ramsey Plus Financial Peace University, you'll understand why. We explain why you get to baby step four when you do and invest at that point. So you can put everything extra, have a bigger shovel to pay off that debt. That will make a lot more sense. So you stay on the line. We'll get you that subscription that will give you the tools that you need to get on the plan and get out of debt. This is The Ramsey Show.
Casey Wright. Joining me today is my good friend, George Camel. He's the host of the Fine Print Podcast. I am author of the new book, Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance, which launched yesterday and is now available anywhere books are sold, including, excitingly, Target, Woo! which is so fun. I went to Target and signed them here in Nashville. And so you can get your copy anywhere books are sold. And we are taking your calls, 888 888- Eight two five five two two five. Of course, we always take your money calls. But if you want to talk about the struggle of feeling balanced, having life balance, managing your time, something we never feel like we have enough of, uh, give us a call. I'm here for you all day. And we are on this kick this week celebrating the launch of my new book. Of course, if you want to talk about business, life, relationships, we are here for any of it. That's triple eight. 825-5225. Blinds.com, 100% satisfaction guarantee means that even if you mismeasure or pick the wrong color, they will remake your blinds for free. You get free samples, free shipping, and with the new promo codes they run every month, you'll save even more. Use promo code RAMSEY to get the best deal. Today's question comes from David in Minnesota. My wife and I have followed the baby steps and thought we were in a good position financially until COVID. We both were unemployed for several months, which meant we had to use up our emergency fund to get by. Thankfully, we've been able to find new jobs, but it was a real wake-up call. How can we be better prepared in case there's another round of COVID or another pandemic? That's a great question. And David, I'm sorry that you guys went through this. That is so tough when both people lose their jobs. And uh, I'm really glad you had the emergency fund. I mean, that's that's the time you're using. It's unexpected. It's urgent. Uh, it's necessary, and you guys did the right thing here by dipping into it to get by. Uh, but the question here is, how can we be better prepared in case there's another round of COVID, another pandemic? And what I don't want here, David, let me start with this, is that I don't want you guys to get paranoid and go, we just have to keep socking away so much cash because we just don't know what's coming. Uh, we found that six months is enough to get most people by. So I don't know how much you guys had in there. If you did have three months and you thought your jobs were more stable, because we teach you want to have closer to six months if you have someone with an unstable job, if you have dependents, if you have chronic illness, if you have some things like that going on. So if I were you guys, I'd build this thing back up to six months of full expenses across the board. Uh, to prepare in case something else happens. I'd also, I, I hope you guys are, it sounds like you're, you're working new jobs now and I hope they're more stable. That's another thing is making sure at least one of you does have a stable job. It's where you're not both maybe working a commission job where things could get tight if another pandemic happened. Yeah, and it's interesting too because I think sometimes we can make decisions based on fear because, oh, wow, we both experienced unemployment last year and that scarred us. You know, that's this deep wound. Now it feels like, oh, I've got to stockpile all this money. I've got to have so much more money in case this happens again. And the reality is your emergency fund did exactly what it's supposed to do. It took care of you in an emergency. And that was one unlike anybody ever saw coming. And so, yeah, I I totally agree, George. That's what it's for. And it did what it's supposed to do. If you want to keep up to six months, that's great. And um, and I do think that, you know, and we're seeing this across the world, uh, even though you're still seeing different reports on COVID cases in different states and different whatever, um, the world is more operational than it was last year. It just is. More industries are getting back. They're finding creative ways to stay in business, make money and so on. And so hopefully with more stable jobs, potentially six months emergency fund and the world being more operational, you're going to be in a good position. You're going to be okay. All right, let's go to Salt Lake City, Utah with Robert. Hey, Robert, how are you? Doing well yourself. Great. What's going on? Well, I'm almost into baby step number four. Awesome. And my question is related on how to account for a pension with the 15% that you recommend. Okay. So my pension is fully funded by my employer. And so, and they funded at 18% of my current salary. But when I retire, I'll have right around 66% of my salary. Okay. What are um, what are some of the details around it? How much control do you have over it, if any? Um, I I get to pick what funds and where the money is managed, and the investment that kind of goes into it. So, within reason, they do manage it and charge me a small fee. But if I take that management off, then I can put it all in high risk or all low risk. Gotcha. That's good. Yeah. Is this a is this like a state or federal company? What kind of company is this? Yes, a governmental agency. Okay, great. That makes me feel better because it's going to be more stable. 
Uh, the government can't go out of business, technically. I hope not. <laughs> God forbid. So that makes me feel better about this. And you're saying that they contribute 18%. Right. So there is a, there's a small percentage I put in, three, and then they put in 15. Wow. So you're only putting in 3% right now? Or you're Correct. about to? Through the pension. No. It's uh, automatic withdrawal. It's uh, to participate in the program. It has to be that way. They want some skin in the game. Yep. Okay. And just you're saying, do through. I need to still do the 15% in baby step four towards retirement if they're contributing 15 for me? Correct. And that, that is my question then is, you know, do you do you recommend an additional 15 on top of that pension? Or, you know, would you recommend, okay, maybe do five into a 401k or a Roth? With something like this that's real stable with a state, federal kind of company, I'm okay with you kind of splitting the difference here and counting the pension as half of the retirement. So the other half, I want you to be contributing uh, towards that, and then the rest can be gravy on top. Because you said it's 66%. Uh, so even that, I don't know where that's going to leave you. You know, if you just contributed zero or just the minimum, I don't like that financial position for you as you retire. How old are you? 35. 35. This is great. So you're going to be working another 25 years at least? Yeah, well, hopefully less, but yeah. Most, most <laughs> hopefully you can retire early, and that's where this advice comes into play. You're Based on your goals, if you're saying you want to retire early, then I want you to have uh, the ball in your court. And to me, that means investing as much as you can, at least half of that um, I want from your side, if not more. If you can do more, do more, especially as you get towards you know baby step seven where you've got a paid-for house, and now the only thing left to do is build wealth and give – outrageously. And so that's going to put you in a great position as you enter baby step four. You've got a fully funded emergency fund. You have no debt. Do you have the margin to contribute 15% on top of that? Um, maybe. I guess I'd have to crank the numbers and go through it. Um, it, is a, it is a possibility, I guess. Once I, once I get through number three, I'd feel better about it. Um, yes. Because I'm, I'm almost through three. Okay, that's good. Well, let this fuel you because I think this is a great, I mean, it's fantastic that they're contributing this. This is coming from their money, not yours, this 15%? That's correct. I put in three, they automatically put in 15. I love that. They're not taking 18% out of your paycheck. They're putting in 15% out of, out of their money and then you contribute 3%. So if I'm you, I would contribute as much as you can up to that 15. And if you make it halfway, that's great. But as you start to make more money and you get in a better financial position, I would say keep keep at it and get up to that 15% on your own. Yeah. And the, the reason that we look at it a little bit differently is it really comes down to the control, the control and the ownership. And, and George, I love to help people understand, especially everybody listening right now, even if you don't have a pension, for them to understand the principle at play when we answer questions the way that we do. When you don't have control over something or ownership of something, even though Robert, in your scenario, you have a little bit of control, you don't have complete control and you don't have complete ownership. And so that that increases the risk if you change jobs, things things change. And so it's more stable. So we're good with you counting some of it. But if you were to go ahead and fund your retirement with 15% or whatever you can after you get through baby step three, all that does is put you in a better position. So, so when we're answering some of these questions and when you guys are thinking through this, when you're going through the baby steps, uh, don't look at it as what is the bare minimum I can do. More is better when it comes to investing. More yeah. is better when it comes to putting, you know, putting more on your house, moving through the baby steps faster. And we don't want you to, you know, completely sacrifice everything and not have a life at all, especially in baby steps four, five, and six. But if you've got a pension that is a little bit got some unpredictable aspects of it, yeah, go ahead and fund your retirement at least some, if not up to 15% on your own. And all that's going to do is put you in a more stable better financial position. So yeah. we want you guys to have that control. And you can't take it with you when you go. That's right. Versus passing it down with your own investments to your kids. That makes a big difference. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ramsey Wright, George Camel, and I are answering your calls here on The Ramsey Show. 888-825-5225. We are celebrating the launch of my new book, Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance. If you feel like you are pulled in a million different directions, me too. <laughs> I have been there. It's a struggle when you've got a lot of things going on. Even if they're good things, sometimes we can get overwhelmed in our busy lives. And I want to help you get control over that. I want to help you spend your time on what's most important to you. And that is the heart behind this book. It's not a productivity book. Like we were saying, George, it is not a book about how to do more. It's not one more obligation on your to-do list. It's actually a book that is going to set you free from that pressure where you can take a deep breath, a sigh of relief and enjoy your life more. You can get your copy at RamseySolutions.com and anywhere books are sold, including your local Target. I, love I went yesterday here in Nashville. It's on an end capped wood, which is super exciting right there when you walk by. Uh, so go check it out. Get your copy of Take Back Your Time. This is exciting launch week. And by the way, we're doing an event tomorrow night. That's Dave right. Ramsey and I will be speaking uh, as a part of our kickoff for launch week. And so you can go to RamseySolutions.com and get your ticket, your live stream ticket. By the way, if you um, if you can get the book and, and ticket bundle there on the site um, and you can join us. If you're in Nashville, come for the book signing and launch party. And if not, just join us on live stream. We will be talking about how to take back your time. And Dave will be telling the backstory of when I first started talking about this and he didn't like it. It's a hilarious story. <laughs> it's worth tuning in just for that. It's basically the forward of the book. The forward of the book written by Dave Ramsey starts with, I tried to talk her out of it. So you know it's going to be a good story. He's a fantastic storyteller and he and I have a fun banter back and forth. Uh, we like to debate on things. I lose most of them, but it doesn't stop me from trying. George. It does not. <laughs> I will give you that. <laughs> doesn't stop me from trying. Ten years later, I get a book out on this topic. So uh, you guys can check that out at RamseySolutions.com. All right, we're going to go to Anna in LA. Hey, Anna, how are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's going on? Okay. So my husband and I are in escrow on a house here um, in Irvine, more locally, Orange County area. And it was at 950K. The prices out here are outrageous, but we're tired of renting. Our rent has gone up. We ran into problems with our landlord. And so we just made the leap to get into the market. Um, the only thing is, is that our appraisal came back under 11800 so in order to meet the rents, we would have to be cashing out stock and, of course, paying taxes on that. And so my question is, is how much is too much to put down on a house here in California? Because we just saw another one yesterday that was listed at 950K, but they've been going on over. Sorry, to speak directly into your phone, Anna. We're losing you here. Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, the the prices out here have been going for fifty thousand, a hundred thousand over asking because it's such a competitive market. So my question is, how much is too much to put down on a house? We do have um, mutual funds, we have our Roth IRAs, and we have our savings. We have about six hundred fifty thousand in all of that. Um, and my husband works for Amazon. He's got a super steady job, and he's vested for more Amazon stock for now, the next two years. That six fifty. How much of that is is actual retirement accounts? Retirement is forty thousand. Mutual funds is three hundred thousand. So the mutual funds are non-retirement, just in a brokerage account. Correct. Yes. Okay. So you've got three hundred there. How much cash are you guys putting down currently outside of any of that on this house? A hundred and eighty thousand, roughly. So you're taking out like an eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage to get this house. Correct. Yikes! What is the payment on that? The payment comes out to forty one hundred. Our rent right now is thirty one hundred. And what's your take home pay? Take home pay. Uh, my husband's is one sixty minus forty. I'm part time. Part time income forty thousand. So you guys are taking home two hundred thousand dollars in your bank account. Correct. Okay. Yeah. What worries me here is that fourth mortgage over four thousand dollars out of your bank. I know you're paying a lot in rent, but we recommend that you don't let that mortgage payment be more than a quarter of your take home pay. And I, I'm assuming this is on a thirty year mortgage. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So another part of our recommendation is to do the 15-year mortgage, um, not only because of the insane interest savings over the cost of the loan when you do a 15-year. The payment is going to be a little bit higher, and people go, well, it's, it's 
cheaper. Why would I not do the 30 year? But uh, yeah. I want you guys to have a life. I want you guys to retire. And I want life to be more than just paying our mortgage until we die, uh, which is that's the sure. American dream, right? And so my, my worry right now is more should you be buying a house right now? And I do love the idea of you cashing out the stock because that's just sitting mm-hmm. there. It's non-retirement. You will pay you know, taxes on that money, but that's going to really set you guys up to where you're not drowning with this mortgage payment. Yeah. Mm. I, I want you to run the scenario of a 15 year and then look at it mm. and see what that, okay. see what that payment would be with putting down what we're talking about here. If you, if you, you know, use your savings, if you cash these out, that's fine. If you put it, put more down, but I want you to run the scenario of with that down payment, what is the payment every single month? on a 15 year, not a 30 year, which is what we recommend. We don't want you to pay all that money in interest over the course of, of 30 years. You guys have a really good take home pay and you have the potential Mm -hmm. to put a lot of money down. Sometimes people can hear these numbers and go, those numbers are crazy, but you're in California, you're in LA. So like, I get that those numbers are, are, but, but here's, it it goes back to what we were saying a minute ago, Anna. It's actually what we said at the very beginning, George, I'm not as interested as what's going on in the market as I am what's going on in your bank account. If you can look at your bank account and go, yes, we can we can run a scenario where we have a great down payment. We're putting Mm -hmm. at least 25 percent down. We've got a monthly Mm -hmm. payment on a 15 year mortgage that's less than 25 percent of our take home pay. Even though these numbers are are bigger than maybe people in other parts of the country can wrap their head around because of where you are. But it it works with the formula and you're in an okay Mm -hmm. position, then that's fine. I just don't want you to you started the question by saying we're tired of renting and I hear you, but that's not a basis for buying a house. The basis for buying the house is that you have the money. And so I just want you to run those scenarios exactly like you're saying, George, and and look at that. What would a 15-year payment be? And do you can you put enough down to make that make sense? And I just crunched the numbers for uh, Anna here on my phone. And on a 30-year, technically, they can afford it. Yeah. It's 25% of right. their take-home pay. But on a 15-year, that's going to jump up. And so what I would do if I was them, if they really want to get this house, they have a great income, and you guys do have the cash uh, position to do it to, to get in this house, you're going to have to cash out some of that stock to get that number below 25% of your take-home pay on the 15-year mortgage. So crunch those numbers and see how much you need to cash out from those stocks. And it was just like we were saying when we were talking about this with the fine print, George's um, podcast that he hosts where he talks about the housing market this week and the episode that dropped this week. It's it's not so much what's going on in the market. It's what you can actually do. And so I don't want you to get into a desperate position like, oh, it's so competitive and oh, I've got to get it and I've got to over, overpay and over, you know, offer way over. Okay. Th- okay. No, no. That, that to me is not the time to buy a house then because if if you don't have the money in your bank account and you're getting desperate and making dumb decisions, desperate decisions are a lot of times dumb decisions and I don't want you to make those decisions. You can keep renting. Is it fun? No. Can you, are you over it? Yeah. But you know what? We can wait till we get a good deal on a house that's fair for you, fair for the market and fair for your bank account. And so, um, you know, on a check out, check out George's latest podcast this week, the fine print we're talking, he's talking about the the housing market specifically, and hopefully that'll help you get a little bit out of the emotional aspect of, Oh, this is so exciting. This frenzy. I've got to do it right now. I'm over renting. Now we got to jump on it and look at it more objectively. Look at the numbers, the 15 year, what makes sense from a stable, objective, unemotional decision. And those are the kind of decisions we want you to make with clarity, not desperate decisions. Yeah. And there's a stat here from that was mentioned in the podcast. In May 2021, house inventory was down 20% and prices were up 23%. Yeah. So there's barely anything available and what is available is super expensive. And so that's where they find themselves and they're in a super high cost of living area. Right, right. And so they're, it's not that they can't afford it. It's just more the emotional part that was the red flag for me where I went, I know the renting stinks and they don't like their landlord. Is there somewhere else that they could rent with a better landlord situation and save up for another year? Yeah. You don't have to move. You want to move and I get that. You don't have to move. And so since you don't have to, you want to wait and make the best decision for you and your bank account and your future. Something you're going to be proud of five years from now. All right, George, this was fun. Thanks for joining me. This is great. I want to thank producer James Child, associate producer Austin Selby, and you, America, for listening in. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. 
If you would like to do your debt-free scream live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studio, this is The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm Christy Wright, author of the book Business Boutique and the new book, Take Back Your Time, which just released yesterday. So this is a super exciting week. A lot of commotion around the office, a lot of media hits. We've got an event tomorrow night. There's a lot of fun stuff going on celebrating the launch of this new book, helping you with a pain point we almost all of us struggle with. How do you have enough time? How do you do it all? That's what we talk about in this new book. And joining me today is my good friend, George Kimmel. He is the host of the Fine Print Podcast. We were just talking in the last hour about this week's episode where he talks about the housing market. Some of you guys are thinking about buying, wondering if it's the right time to buy. He's going to dive into that in this week's episode. You guys should check that out and subscribe and review the Fine Print Podcast, which is awesome. He's just shining a light on uh, the fine print, literally, that many of you don't know and don't even know the right questions to ask. So I'm so grateful for that. We are here today for you. We are answering your calls. 888-825-5225. If you've got a question about money or the housing market or managing your time, or changing careers, starting a business, any of the above. George and I are here for you. We want to talk to you. We want to talk about what you want to talk about. We're going to go to New Orleans with Tina. Hey, Tina, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you today? Great. What's going on? Well, I am 55 and I'm disabled, so I can't use this money that I came into for investments and things because then it takes away my disability. So I'm wondering, I have an older car, not you know, has over 100,000 miles, if I should take this money and pay cash for, I'm thinking like a Kia or something that will last me a good 15 or 20 years. What kind of car do you have now? Right now, I have a 2010 Dodge Caliber, um, but it's a salvaged vehicle and it has over 102,000 miles on it. Okay. So what's, the, what's wrong with this car now? There's not a lot wrong with it, but like I said, because I'm on disability, I can't just hold on to this cash. I mean, I guess I could hide it under my mattress and nobody would know, but um, I'm thinking, you know, maybe a a new car, and I'm thinking brand new with no miles on it, that would last me until hopefully I almost die or can't drive anymore. I just, I, 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 I don't know the details of the the limitations Mm -hmm. on disability income. So you may have to help me and George, you jump in here. You're the finance expert in this scenario, but I, I am, I do feel like you've got to have more options than just putting all this money into a brand new car or under your mattress. I feel like I must be missing something here. There must be another option. I'm I'm not not considering. No, I'm only allowed to have $2,000 in my bank account. Where, uh, what what money are we referring to? What money did you get and where did it come from? Um, I had a small piece of property in Mexico, and I sold it. Oh, okay. Can you reinvest that money into real estate or into anything else that does not go down in value like a car? I live with my mom, so I don't need to um, invest in real estate or a house because I'll be getting her house when she passes away. Um, And if I don't have a house that I'm personally living in, then um, according to their rules, I can't do that. Interesting. Can According you invest to it? Social Security disability. You're, and you're no, saying you can't, can't invest it. Okay. Um, no, they say I can't invest it because then it's considered income, and then they'll take away from the little bit I get every month. I get like $720 a month. Well, this is so stupid. So, 
Yeah, I mean, this is the stupidest. Stu- <laughs> are, are we trying to not take care of people that are struggling with disability? I mean, this is so yeah, dumb. This, I've I've never heard the finer details of this. I feel like uh, this explained. is a future uh, fine print podcast. Yeah, this might be a future episode, Tina. You got us on this one. So, it, let's talk it, about this car. Is. Um, okay. Do you have any debt? Um, no, I have no debt. My only bills that I have right now is my twenty five dollar a month gym membership and my insurance on this car. Okay. Well, that's good news. Let's talk about this car mm-hmm. now. You said, I need a new car. I want to drive this thing for 15 to 20 years. And we don't recommend that people buy new cars unless they are millionaires because it okay. goes down like a rock in value. And let me tell you, the mileage part, I drive an 09 Honda Civic that has 160,000 miles on it. I'm probably the seventh owner. I have no idea how many owners came before me. And she purrs, Christy. She drives great. <laughs> and so I, the idea that you need to get a new car because of reliability or the mileage, I think you can get a great used car, maybe a four. How much cash do you have to spend on this car if you didn't take out any debt? Um, um, if I don't take out any debt, I have about $26,000. Oh, my goodness. Oh, okay. You're going to be living yeah. large in this car. This is fantastic news. So I would, I personally, in your position, probably wouldn't spend $26,000 on a used car. Um, but you no. can get a great, reliable car. Um, obviously, Toyota and Honda are known for, if you're looking for longevity, uh, There's they're, mm-hmm. they're going out there. They're 300 plus thousand miles on Toyotas and Hondas out there uh, with very little maintenance. And I don't know about you. I'm not a fixer-upper. I'm no Chip Gaines. I'm no Bear Grylls. I'm not a <laughs> DIY guy, Tina. So if what? I'm you... This shocks me, George. I know. This shocks me. Shocker to many, uh, many of Americans listening today. So if I'm you, I'm, I'm going to get a used uh, Toyota or a used Honda if you're looking for longevity and mileage. And you can do that for well under 20 grand. All right. The, the one what other. Is your, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead, Tina. Um, what do you think about a Kia? I hear good things about them. I, I okay. Here's my personal take, and uh, Kia's come a long okay. way. I will say that. But as a person who has researched a lot of cars, I have found that Kias are not going to be uh, in the top. You know, the top five. Uh, when it comes to longevity, maintenance, cost, all those types of things. So okay. I would look into a Toyota or Honda, uh, Accord or Civic on the Honda side, uh, Camry or Avalon on the Toyota side if you if you like a sedan. And that's going to get you very far for a long, long period of time with very little uh, time in the shop. Yeah. I don't know about you, but dr- bringing my car to the shop is a nightmare. So that's, that's my personal take. I'm sure there's review sites out there that'll put Key in the top. And some of their vehicles um, may be better, but if I I just want to not worry about it. I'm probably going Toyota or Honda from in your shoes. Yeah, just for the the reliability. And this is multiple different uh, ob- objective sites that that rate these cars. This is not just George and I's opinion. Even though you, we we do all have the brands that we like or we go to first. Um, but look into it. The other thing I'll say, Tina, and I and I and I, I'm guilty of being just you know I get on. I'm really persistent with things, but I just, I really want you to sit down with someone, um, a, a financial coach. We, we, you know, we've got these here at Ramsey Solutions, uh, an investment professional, someone to dig into this. Is there any other way around it? Not because you can't get a car. That's not the point of this. I just hate the fact that you're making a decision on a car mainly because you're not allowed to keep this money that is your money. When there may be a way to spend 10 of it on a used car and then do something with the other 16 or maybe in the future if you it, or, or some, inherit some money or something to, to know what your options are versus, oh, I've yeah. just got to get rid of it because I'm not allowed to have it. That is just – that is stupid. I don't like her being locked in like that. I don't like any of it. It makes so me mad. Will you, just, will you just keep looking, Tina? Will you keep looking into that? Sit down with an investment professional or a financial coach and just see if you have any other options you may not be aware of that are not as um, widely known at this point. I want what's best for you and so does George. This is The Ramsey Show. What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices, and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings. If 
there's one thing that 2020 taught us about investing, it's this. You cannot invest alone. You need someone in your life who knows the market better than you and helps you make smart decisions. By the way, George and I both have these people in our lives. We don't do it ourselves and we work at this company. You need someone in your corner. Now, I love do-it-yourselfers, but data tells us that we mess up when we DIY on investing, especially when there is a global crisis. You invest in the wrong things, you get caught up in trends, you make rookie mistakes, you build a portfolio based on what you read on Reddit. Oh, God, please don't do anything based on what you see on Reddit. (laughs) Trust me, you don't need to add any unnecessary stress in your life. Let 2020 be your wake-up call that never again will you let your investments be at the mercy of some global crisis. Get some people in your corner. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash SmartVestor, and we'll put you in touch with one of our SmartVestor pros who can walk you through this. There are some areas that you can do it yourself. Y'all, this isn't one of them. We're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, potentially, potentially if you do it right and you follow our baby steps early in life, potentially millions of dollars that's at stake here. Don't guess. Don't just Google this and try to figure it out as you go. You need someone that this is what they do all day, every day. Get a Smart Vester Pro in your corner. You can also text INVEST to 33789, and we will get you in touch with someone that we trust. These are people that we use, people that you can trust as well. Christy, I can't even DIY sourdough bread. So if you think I'm going to mess around with thousands and thousands of dollars, you're wrong. There are some areas that you just need some help. All right, let's go to Tyler in L.A. Hey, Tyler, how are you? Hey, how's it? How's you guys doing? Great. What's going on? Hey, um, so I had a quick question. I, um, I'm born and raised in Hawaii, so I just moved out to um california recently i have a home in hawaii and i have a business in hawaii and uh we're looking to buy another house up here in california but my question is i've been working less and less and less um with this whole um you know remote working and uh, i'm getting a little itchy to either you know like get a job up here or start a new business up here or I don't know if I should just burn the ships in Hawaii and sell the house and sell the business. I mean, I'm just looking for some outside, uh, you know, opinion on on what maybe I should do because all this is all this is uh, like new to me. Yeah. So yeah. my wife's from California, so we decided when the pandemic hit in Hawaii or in the world, I guess um, I was working remotely, and then we're like, man, we have a chance to move, you know, because you know we're still making money with me not, you know, being out and about in the field and stuff. So. We decided to do it, and uh, you know, here we are. And I feel like I got one leg on both sides of the fence here. And uh, you know, uh, I mean, that's basically the question: is uh, um, you know, maybe some guidance on uh, on um, what, what I next? should do. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Give me a little bit more information. What's your business in Hawaii? Um, it's a, it's a, it's like an RMR company. So. It's got recurring monthly revenue, so it makes a lot of money. It does like a, a million a year. It's a really good company. I promoted one of my guys to uh, a general manager, and I really helped him. And then now I'm just doing less and less. You know, I have Zoom meetings with them on Friday and Mondays, but I mean, I'm just doing less and less. So, are you planning to go back to Hawaii? Up, yeah, I go back all the time. I've okay. only been up here for like three months. My wife's from here, so I gotcha. Mean, she's from here, so okay. So you have yeah. a house in Hawaii. A house in California, yeah. and you go back and forth, kind of. Well, no, I, I own a house in Hawaii, and I wanted to buy a house in California, but I mean, California is just so stupid right now. I had to give the guy a whole year of rent, so I gave him like fifty grand so we could just get to California to try and buy a house here. Gotcha. So we're looking around to buy a house here in California now. When I get the house in California, I'll put my Molly house on. It's either I sell it or I'll, I'll put it on like a fifteen-year fix and refinance it after we close over here. Because the whole goal is my kids, I want my kids in school up here because Maui with COVID or Hawaii with COVID is so bad that it's like, that's why we, that's why we came up here. Gotcha. Okay. So are you completely debt free? Oh, no, I have debt. All right. Yeah. Are you familiar with what we teach? Uh, I just heard about you guys and I've been listening to you guys um, 
my father-in-law is, you know, he bought a house in Arizona and he doesn't owe anything. And he's got a house in Hawaii. He doesn't owe anything. And he's the one that told me about you guys. So I was, I've been listening for a couple of weeks and then I just figured I'd, I'd call. So. Cool. Well, here's the thing, Tyler, and, and I'm going to let George jump in here, but I just want to start by saying this. It sounds like you need some goals. You feel a little bored. You need some goals. And here's the great news. We're about to give you some goals. Oh, we're, yeah. We're about to give you okay, some good. goals, Tyler. So just get a pen and paper. George, take it away. So, you know, Zig Ziglar says if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And right now, you know, you've got the business running on the side and you're kind of aiming at nothing. But it sounds like you do have financial goals. You want to buy a house. You let that you, you made that clear. But you've got a pile of debt here. How much debt do we do you have total? Um, I don't. The only I have a brand new uh, 2021 black on black Tahoe for my wife. That's a lease, and then I've got my truck, and then I've got a couple of vans for the guys. So and you've got debt on the vans. Uh, Do you know how much the total is? Uh, I'd say like maybe like fifty grand. Fifty grand. That feels low for what you just laid out there. I mean, the 2021 Tahoe alone feels like that could be fifty grand. Yeah, but it's a lease, so it's only like sixteen thousand. Is all it is. That, What's you know, what? Do you know what the I'm early required. buyout would be? I don't know that yet. No, I don't. Okay. No. So, what is your income? Um. Well, I I take one hundred and fifty thousand from the company, and uh, my wife is amazing, and she takes uh, fifty thousand. She doesn't do anything in the business, but she takes fifty thousand, so two hundred thousand a year. Okay. And uh, I want this side hustle, now that we're talking about this, I want this to be to pay off this debt. I mean, you guys have a great income. Obviously, you're in a high cost of living area, and so it feels more difficult to do anything because, like you said, it's just stupid right now. Uh, but I want this side hustle, whatever it is. You seem like an, you're an entrepreneurial guy. Is that right? Absolutely. I don't think I could ever work for somebody. Yeah, I, don't, I can't picture you taking a side hustle. For 14 years I've had this business. So Wow. Well, it's successful. So whatever you're doing, you're good at it. And so is there something you could spin up in California to bring in income and pay off this debt really quickly? Well, that's the thing. Like I said, I could burn the shit. If I sell the, ho- uh, if I sell the house in Hawaii, um, the house in Hawaii is worth a million dollars. I owe like three seventy five on it. So, I mean, I don't know if I should keep the business. Well, do you need the, the house, house in Hawaii? Well, eventually, you know, I wanted to, be able to be in Hawaii for summers and then be up here during the year. That's the goal. Do you need you know? the house that big in Hawaii? Like, could you? Would you sell it and then you could downsize and get something smaller later on in life? Yeah, sure, we could. I well, like this. I like this idea only because I don't know how much you're using this house. What What's going on with the house when you're not there? Well, it's rented right now for five thousand a month. Well, that's not bad. It's rented. Yeah, it's rented right now. So. Yeah. There's and a lot going on here. here was, ran up here was four grand, so I did. Uh, I had to pay him a whole year. Yeah. So. Well, what I would tell you as far as the goals go is I want you to follow the baby steps that we teach, which is have $1,000 for a starter emergency fund, which I imagine you have that. Uh, and then baby step two is where we pay off all of the debt. And that means no more leasing cars. That means no more debt on the work vans. Uh, I want you to just live a debt-free lifestyle because if you do that, you're going to be so unbelievably wealthy. You're going to be bored out of your mind. I can't wait to see how bored you are once you had, don't have any payments in your life and you can do whatever you want. And but- so once we've got that, we can get the emergency fund start investing, and I don't know where you're at with that side of things, but you, I want you to do things in order so that you feel the progress. Well, and the, the whole why behind what we teach, Tyler, is the quickest path to building wealth. That's the why. So we have seven baby steps, and George just referenced that really quickly. The, the why of the baby steps is to get you to wealth, true wealth, which means debt-free wealth, where you own everything and you can do anything you want to. Businesses, houses, you can do whatever you want. Give outrageously. I want you to stay on the line. I'm going to have Austin get you registered for our game plan event. This is coming up in September, September 28th. I'll be speaking along with George, Dave Ramsey, and we're going to give you a game plan for your money. This is exactly what you need right now, now, Tyler. It's going to give you the steps and the plan that you need to reach your goals. So stay on the line. We'll get you registered for that event.
times in the past year have you heard someone say, I wish things would just get back to normal? Maybe you've said it. But what was normal like for you? Worried about money? Too much to do? Not enough time to do it? Been there. You shouldn't have to go back to that normal. There is so much better ahead for you. But if you want to get the life you want, you need the right game plan. So I want to remind you about an event we are doing on September 28th. This is a free live stream called Game Plan Live. We're going to give you a game plan for your money, for your time, and for your goals. We're going to show you step by step what you need to do to get to where you want to be. George Camel and myself and Dave Ramsey will all be speaking. We will be laying out clear goals and the path to get there. We're even going to talk about how to have a vision that gets you excited. We're going to talk about how to set healthy boundaries that keep you focused. And of course, how to take control of your money so it can start working for you. You don't have to go back to the normal that is broke and burned out. We're going to help you make this year different, but you're going to need a game plan to do it. You can have the abundant, balanced, debt-free life that you want. And it starts at Game Plan Live. To register for the live stream, text Game Plan to 33789. That's Game Plan, all one word, to 33789. We'll get you registered, get your spot. It's going to be a really great night. And I encourage you, if you're married, have older kids, watch it with your family. We're going to give you some language around this where you guys can come together and talk about your goals, talk about your values, talk about your vision, talk about your boundaries, talk about what you want this next season of life to look like so that you can be on the same page and watch how it brings you even closer together as a family. I'm excited. George, give us a tease of what you're going to be talking about at the game plan event. So one of the biggest things I found, because I've been where a lot of people are, where they set like 48 goals and they're like, new year, new me. Like, I'm actually <laughs> going to do it this year. I'm going to read 85 books. I'm going to lose 25 pounds. And I never accomplished them. And I finally realized after a few years of doing this, what went wrong. And so I'm kind of letting you learn from all of my mistakes. And so we're going to learn how to set the right goals for the right reasons. And even better, how to create the right habits and systems so that you can actually accomplish them. Yeah. And so and you're coming alongside me right after that to really help people go, okay, now how do I fit this all in my life? Because right. that's what I found. I got all I got all these books I want to read and I go, oh, I didn't plan the hour every day to read. Right, right. We've got all kinds of goals and we're excited. We're even motivated. We've got great intentions. But yeah, how do you make the time for it? Or as people often ask me, how do I find the time? How do I find the time to it's work couch out? cushion. And I say, you don't find time. You don't find time. You make time. You never find time lying around. I'm going to show you how to make time for things that matter the most to you. And I think you guys are going to leave that night really inspired and excited. But you're also going to have tactical steps that you can follow to put this stuff into action. So be sure to get your spot for game plan. It's free. It's free. You got nothing to lose. But you do need to get your spot. Do you do that. need to get your spot, RSVP, get your spot, text game plan, all one word, to 33789. All right, let's go to Matt in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Hey, Matt, how are you? I'm doing okay. How about you? Great. What's going on? All right. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, so I, I'm a high school personal finance teacher, and I actually teach um, your you know, Dave Ramsey program awesome. uh, for teenagers. And, uh, you know, you know, what I'm trying to ask is, um, you know, I don't just tell them that I'm just take, teaching you to teach this. I actually tell them I do live this. I try to, you know, I try to do the steps just like I'm trying to encourage them to do. Uh, one of the things though that I noticed, and, you know, I try to bring in, you know, stories from my life. We do the videos, we do the worksheets, you know, like I'm trying to, I can see it on their faces sometimes. I think they think some of this is just a hoax. You know, <laughs> they like just they think, don't care, you know, Matt. Go well, ahead and say it. They just life, don't care. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was your life where you screwed up and you made mistakes, or that was Dave's life. I'm so and so, you know. So how do I, how do I break through that wall? You know, if you, if you get what I'm saying. So do they think they have it all together? They're like, I don't need this stuff. This isn't important. I to think me. some of it. I really do believe some of them think this is. You know, they, they got it all together. That this is the hoax. And I tried to tell them the folks that think that they have it all together are the ones that are going to come apart first. Mm. Well, here's think I'm nuts. Here's what's interesting, Matt. A couple things um, I'll say, and then I'll let George jump in here. But the I spoke to high school students on money for about mm -hmm. six years before I ever was doing business coaching, 
uh, life coaching, any of the stuff that I'm doing now. And one of the things that is so difficult, and you know this better than anybody because you're on the front lines, is it is so hard to make a high school student care about something they just don't care about. Specifically, Mm -hmm. it's hard to make them care about a topic that they feel is not relevant to them right now. So you can Mm -hmm. talk all day about being on a budget, but if they've got the 24-hour ATM of mom and dad, they're not really motivated to give every dollar a name because they just asked mom for a 20. Can I have a 20? Can I have a 20? So part (laughs) of it is you have an uphill battle in the fact that you're teaching them something that either is not reinforced at home or is just not even it's just not even a conversation at home. So the one thing I would say just to kick this off as we dig into this with you is anytime you can have a conversation with the parents at parent teacher conferences, tell them what you're talking about, ask the students to go home and ask the parents, do you have any debt? How do you feel about debt? Begin to ma- involve the parents and almost come alongside them and say, hey, let's together help set them up for success. And some may be resistant. Some may have some shame of their own money mistakes. But until you get the parents on board, it's going to be harder to break through because there's not a real uh, consequence, reward, or even motivation. And the other thing I would just encourage you is, um, and I'm definitely a, a product of this, of being a high school student, but you are planting seeds that you may not see grow even by the time they graduate, but you have no idea what that's going to turn into and how it is sticking with them. So I just want to encourage you, even if you don't see a huge transformation right now, in the back of their mind, that these conversations, these lessons might come to mind when they're offered a credit card in college and they make a different decision. We we heard a really cool story from a young man that um, was on the fence of which go- college to go to. One, he was thinking about taking out a ton of student loans because it was his quote unquote dream school. And another one, he mm-hmm. could pay cash and work his way through. And he ended up paying cash, working his way through. He's completely debt free, making an incredible income. And he attributes that to our foundations and personal finance course. So even if you're not seeing light bulbs go off, that doesn't mean you're not planting seeds that will come into play later. But it's Mm -hmm. hard, George. This is a hard audience to teach because they're just, they just don't care. High (laughs) schoolers, I'm not, I'm not usually scared on stage. High schoolers, they put the fear of God in me. They're just sitting there with their arms crossed, right? They're sitting back and they're like, they look like they're actually asleep. Yes. Like, you're not cool. I see right through your soul. You're a loser. I'm like, oh my gosh, I guess I'm a loser. And so here's what I found. High schoolers, middle school, they're they're insecure and they're they're playing it off with this kind of false confidence like they're too cool for everything and so what i found because i actually hosted the latest edition of our uh foundations and personal finance curriculum and as i'm writing these scripts i'm like how do i connect with a 16 year old i'm like what would 16 year old george want to see on the screen and i realized I just need to own my mistakes and be self-deprecating, connect with them where they're at and talk about their goals, not talk about me and why it's important to invest in the power of compound interest. I want to get their vision for what they want for their life. And usually when you get them talking about themselves, then they're bought in to why it connects to what you're trying to teach them in personal finance. So, um, Matt, Mm -hmm. I love what you're doing. I already love teachers in general. Sure. But especially the ones that are teaching personal finance and even more so the ones that teach our personal finance curriculum. (laughs) And so I don't know the way what your class is like. They may love you already, uh, but get them to talk about their dreams and their goals. And what I found is it is like an interrogation when you ask them about college. They say, what do you want to do? How much is that going to cost? Do you know how much that is a semester? Do you know how much books are? How much student loan debt are you willing to take on? And you start to ask these questions and they get all frozen. They go, oh my gosh, I need to learn some things. I got to Google some stuff. I got to talk to mom and dad. And like you said, Christy, they're not having these conversations at home. So Matt, you are an especially important part of their lives. And so you can pour into them even more so than some of their parents who are maybe unwilling to have these conversations, don't agree with the Ramsey principles because they're drowning in debt and feel like it's normal. And so what I would do if I was you is connect with them on their dreams and their goals and get on their level and don't talk at them, talk with them. And once you do that, it's going to be a partnership where they're going, hey, teacher, how can I learn more about this? This is fascinating. It may just take some time, but Matt, you're doing awesome. That's a hard job and we commend you. We are so grateful for you doing that hard work on the front lines. And we really do believe that that is going to pay off. You're planting seeds. You may see it tomorrow. You may see it this year. You may not, but I believe it's going to stick with them in more ways than you know. Great job. Thanks for calling. This is The Ramsey Show.
Chrissy Wright, George Camel, and I are taking your calls at 888-825-5225. Calls about money, calls about what decision you want to make, how to manage your time. You know, George, one of the things that's been interesting in um, the last 10 years of, of coaching people in business, and I, I'm kind of known as the, the business girl, right? I've spoken at Entree Leadership. You host the Entree Leadership podcast. Um, and I've helped women and, and men at all stages of business. But what's interesting is of all the events I've spoken at, of all the different people I've worked with in different types of businesses, over the last decade of doing this, the number one question I'm asked is not a business question. It's this question, how you balance it all. I get it on every Entree Leadership event, every Q&A, every panel, coaching sessions, it doesn't matter. Male or female, kids or no kids, different ages, it doesn't matter. We all struggle with this idea of balancing it all. And one of the things I've noticed is we always talk about it in that way, how do I balance it all? Like balance is a verb, you know, and we think, oh, I've got to have this 50-50 split between work and home, or I've got to do everything for an equal amount of time. And the truth is we, we just try to do more. We try to be more productive, wake up earlier, stay up later, multitask, be more efficient, be more productive, pour more coffee. <laughs> and we just end up exhausted. Yeah. And I think we're asking the wrong question. I think when we think the solution to our problem with time is more time, we're getting it wrong. Because if we had more time, we would just cram more in. Yep. If you had a 25th hour, right. you just overschedule even more. You would. You just try to please more people, do more stuff. Get run. less sleep. Right. <laughs> I'll just sleep one hour less. It's fine. We'll make it work. Oh, I know. And that's honestly, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to tackle this topic. We joked earlier about, um, you know, the history of this with me and Dave and this back and forth. Dave wrote the foreword for my new book, Take Back Your Time. But it's such a pain point for people. And because I have that entrepreneur spirit, I've got the problem solver spirit in me that I want to tackle things that are hard. But it's also something I've needed for myself, having three kids in five years and a busy career and being in seminary and having a lot of interest. It, it is hard. Like, I get it. It's yeah. hard. It's easy to get overwhelmed in our culture with a lot going on. And one of the, I think one of my favorite parts about um, this journey of writing this book and putting this out there this week with Launch Week is that the feedback I'm getting is so consistent and it's so exactly in line with what I wanted it to do. They're saying things like, this is not another time management book. This is not a productivity book. This book lets me breathe. This book sets me free in my life. And I'm going, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't want to help you just do more and be more efficient. Yeah, we're going to talk about the calendar, but I want to help you figure out why you felt out of balance in the first place and fix it there. Yeah, that's so big. Because, you know, on the show for years, Dave has been setting people free with money. Right. And with this book, you're setting people free with their life. Yeah. And not feel this sense of, I'm never doing enough. I'm doing too much. I'm overwhelmed. Things are out of control. I'm burning out. And it's all in the name of busyness and everyone's too busy and everyone's yeah. overscheduled and we have so much to keep up with. And we have this conversation on the Entree Leadership Podcast a few episodes oh, back. that's right, yeah. We sat down and unpacked some of the incredible principles in the book and you make it so easy. It feels like you're like, well, yeah, balance is just a myth. That's not a thing people actually achieve. And you talk about uh, all these different ways and the questions that you need to be asking to get there. And so there's so many practical takeaways in the book. It's not just encouraging. Yeah. There's actual tactical things that you oh. walk through there. It, it's just incredible. So I'm so pumped for this book. If you don't have a copy by now and you've been listening, I don't know what they've, they've heard about this book for like 18 months now. <laughs> what are you doing? You need to get a copy and get one for like every person in your life to say, I love you and I want you to set you free yeah. with your time. Well, I, I one of the things that's been funny too is because this word balance, people have such mixed feelings, but they're like, oh, balance, about like they kind of have eye rolls and, you know, uh, groans or whatever. And it's funny because as much as we hate the word, we can't stop talking about it. And so someone asked me on a media interview this week, they said, I think it's pretty bold that you just went ahead and said the guilt-free guide to life balance. I was like, oh yeah, I want to call it what they call it. I want to reclaim that word, redefine that word and show you how it actually is possible, but it doesn't mean what you think. It means something else. And that something else, in fact, is possible. And that's good news. And so um, if you guys want to get your copy, it is available at RamseySolutions.com, anywhere books are sold. And in case you didn't know, it's at Target. Yeah, and y'all, that just feels like a big deal. Maybe it's because I love Target. Maybe it's because a lot of people that read this book go to Target. It just feels, it's, I think this is one of our first books we've ever gotten in Target. That's a big deal. You know who else got the people. book at Target? Your little girl, Mary Grace. <laughs> I mean, did. your Instagram story of her... 
where's mommy? And she pointed at your book and she grabbed a f- two copies. It's really cute. It was adorable. So I love that your kids are so proud of you. Your husband is so oh, proud no. of you. I, I was in tears looking at his Instagram post it's, about you last night. It's really sweet. Talking about how you, you've you actually living, you've been living out these principles. Yeah. This is not a theory. Yeah. This is real life. And you have put it uh, pen to paper in such a brilliant way. You're such an amazing uh, thought leader thank in this you. space. And these are your words. No, thank you. And your heart on, on this book. And I know you took so much time and care in writing it for a long time and you've been thinking about this topic for a decade. <laughs> it takes that long like, to get this through with Dave Ramsey. It's like a very long pregnancy. <laughs> it's like being pregnant for 10 years. You Not know, that when, I know. When, when you put it like that, George. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I am persistent if nothing else. I'm like, oh, Dave hates this topic. I will not give up. We will write a best-selling <laughs> book on the topic and I'm sure it will be. Oh, I'm so excited about oh this. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. All right. Well, let's go to the phones. We've got Will in Phoenix, Arizona. Hey, Will, how are you? Hey, what's going on, Christy and George? Uh, thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. I'm excited to be here. Um, so as of today, I made my last payment on my student loan. So I did, I'm did. i 25 years old, so I did 35000 in 30 months. Um, so I'm debt-free. Yeah, uh, that's it, Will. Okay. Let's go, Will. Okay, well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been following Dave's principles, and I did the uh, – financial piece through my church. Uh, so it was a very uh, great experience. But now my question is, is like, you know, what's next? Um, I have a 401k through work, but every other investment I'm very green on. I really don't know where to put my money and how to make my money work for me. Um, so I was just calling to get advice from you guys as, you know, someone in my position who's single, 25 years old, uh, is now debt-free, you know, <laughs> where should I go next? Like, how do I put my money to work? I love sure. it. You called the right place, Will. So uh, do you have a fully <laughs> funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses? Um, not yet, no. Okay. So before you get starry-eyed about investing, which I love that you're thinking about this stuff at this age, I want you to save up that baby step three, fully funded emergency fund, three to six months of your expenses, and then we can look at investing. Does that okay. sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So on the investing side, you said you're real green to this stuff. And truthfully, no one knows all the ins and outs unless you're a financial advisor. There's so much out there. Uh, Your 401k is going to be a great option, but there's also other things you need to be looking into, like a Roth IRA, for example. And so what I want you to do is connect with one of our SmartVestor pros. These are trusted pros in your area, investing professionals who can sit down with you and actually help you understand what you're doing. They're not there to just tell you what to do. They're there to educate you on your options and help you make an informed decision. And here's the best part. They're going to do it the Ramsey way. You don't have to wonder if they're going to sell you a crappy product or steer you in a different direction. They're going to do it the Ramsey way. So you can go to RamseySolutions.com, click on Trusted Pros, and connect with one of those uh, in the Phoenix area who can help you understand this stuff. And if you do this at this age, you're going to be a multi-millionaire if you just keep following the baby (laughs) steps, Will. You're crushing it, man. Congratulations on debt freedom. Congratulations. And to be so young, you're 25. You should be able to get this emergency fund pretty quick. I'm guessing your expenses are pretty low at your age and stage of life. And the other thing to keep in mind, Will, if there are things in your life that change in the next few years, because they may, you may want to buy a house, you may get married, you may start a family, all this could happen in the next five to 10 years, potentially being how young that you are, then these are all things you can save up in cash flow. So you save up for a down payment on a house, you save up for a wedding, those types of things, engagement ring and so on. And you're in a position now that you have that debt gone, that you can cash flow all of that. And you are just setting you and any future family up for success and uh and we're cheering you on we're so excited for you so yeah take it one step at a time the baby steps go in that order for a reason we want you to tackle one step at a time especially until baby step four so go ahead and get that emergency fund and then you'll be ready to invest and uh save up for any of those other things what i love about the baby steps is that they build and the habits that you built in baby step one and two they carry on because now you know oh i can actually save up money i know how to do this stuff right i can do this and you start to believe right and it becomes reality and so i love that will's grabbed a hold of the stuff at this age i love it so good thanks for calling will I want to thank producer James Child, associate producer Austin Selby, and you, America. Thanks for tuning in. This is The Ramsey Show. This is James Child, producer of The Ramsey Show. You can listen to all our shows with The Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. Browse by topic or even sync clips to your friends. 
download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studio, this is The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm Christy Wright, author of the new book, Take Back Your Time, the guilt-free guide to life balance that we are celebrating the launch of as of yesterday. It is on the streets, in real life, in stores, including Target, which is so exciting. You can get your copy for yourself, for a friend, and you can take back your time. So feel free to give us a call if you have a question about balancing things, about managing your time. Of course, we're always taking your calls about money. If you want to talk about business, George and I love to talk about marketing. George has a background in marketing, and we both love talking about that. Give us a call, 888 825 George Camel and I are here for you. All right, we're going to go to Seattle, Washington with Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's going on? So I'm just looking for some guidance for um, our son. He's 21 and is renting an apartment with three roommates. Um, One of the roommates is not holding a job and did not pay September rent and has told my son that he is not not going to pay October rent. And my son um, is covering his portion of the rent. And I'm just trying to figure out how to advise him to get through this situation. They have a lease until January, um, but it doesn't seem right that he would have to cover the roommate's rent uh, and it puts him in a, you know, financial hardship. So I'm just not sure what to tell him. Jennifer, do you know the details of the lease? Because for example, when I was in an apartment, it was kind of a college apartment in college, we all had individual leases, even though we were in a traditional apartment. Does, is there one person on the lease or they, do they all have individual leases? I believe they all have individual leases. Okay. But I would have to confirm. Okay. I know this sounds heartless. I'm just going to tell you, he needs to stop paying it. Okay. He needs to stop paying it. If he wanted to do one month as a gift, that's his choice. He can do that. That's generous and kind. But this roommate is not going to be motivated to get a job, keep a job, and pay his rent as long as it's being paid for him. And that's nothing against his friend. That's just, he's just not, he's showing that he's not doing it because there are more job opportunities right now than any time before. Everyone is begging for employees everywhere. He could get a job tonight at a restaurant. They're desperate. So if he doesn't have a job, that's on him. That's not because there's not opportunities out there. And so I'm just, I I struggle with this because your son is the one that's suffering because of this roommate's incompetence, lack of motivation, lack of responsibility, whatever. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, at first I was like, well, I guess the son's the landlord. Because I, yeah, there must be a reason why, for this. Why it's is like, he no. taking this on himself? Is he just a good guy? I think he's just a good guy. He's really concerned about how, you know, this could impact his financial future. He has um, does not have a credit score. He's paid cash for his vehicles. You know, he they paid extra to have the security deposit. And so he just doesn't want the repercussions to come back on him. So but I think separate he's trying to make. Well, I, I have to confirm that. Okay. I think that's how they are set up. But um, if they're not separate leases, what would I advise him to do? Okay, I was going to say, if it's not separate, then I want to know who is on the lease. Because the person okay. on the lease is the person responsible. If it's your son, I can see why he would want to pay that to cover his own behind and not have the repercussions of that. If, if it's a different roommate that's different, then that's between the roommate that won't pay and the roommate that's on the lease. If it's the roommate that's not paying, surely it's not. But if it is, then that's going to fall on him. But either way, your son doesn't have to fill the gap. He doesn't need to fill the gap unless, to your point, he is on the lease and he is somehow responsible for this other roommate. If they're separate, then then there's absolutely no reason he should have to. Does the landlord know that this guy can't pay? 
Uh, my son uh, tried to contact the leasing office yesterday, and he was not able to get a return call yesterday. So I don't know if they're aware of that yet or not. Yeah, I would make them aware of it and let them be the bad guy instead of your son. Um, yes. So that doesn't hurt these relationships. Because it sounds like if I'm the leasing office, I'm going, well, if you can't pay, then we have to get rid of you. You can't live here if you can't pay. That's part of the deal. And so I would let them get involved um, and... I hope he likes the group of guys he's with. Does he? Are they all great friends? No. <laughs> it's not a – they're not very clean. They don't clean up after themselves. So he's he's looking to get out of the situation after the lease is up. Okay. That was my second question. I was like, I don't know what his, what the deal is. If they're all best friends, that's great. But I can't stand a roommate that I can't get along with that's not clean. And so I think he needs to find a different renting situation. Uh, and this is a pretty unique situation where this guy can't pay and is unwilling to work when he easily can go get a job today, like Christy said. People are desperate. Money is out there. Uh, so I would see if he can even get out of the lease early. If this is a toxic situation, even outside of this guy not paying, even if he could pay, he still hates living here. Your son deserves better, and he's in a great financial spot because of a great mom like you who's raised him well. And so I want him to be in a, in a renting situation that he actually enjoys, and maybe that's getting one roommate. You know, depending on where he's at and what he can afford, uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. And you may be able to get out of the lease early uh, looking at the details of it. Yeah, Jennifer, it, Thank it's, you. it's going to come down to the details of this lease. That's what we're telling you. It's going to come down to that. Who is on it? That person is legally responsible for the rent being paid on time. If your son and the other roommates are all on it, then he's only responsible for his part. If the other roommate is on it, whoever is on it on behalf of the entire household is the one that it needs to, um, that is going to feel this financial hit. Uh, but I totally agree with George. Get the landlord involved. Let the landlord be the bad guy. And your son does not need to pay this anymore. Not once more. Not at all. And, um, and, and the fact that this roommate is not working. I can't fathom someone not working right now that has the ability to when the job opportunities are out there and you're not paying rent. That's let's just call it what it is. He's stealing. That roommate is stealing, stealing from your son, stealing from the landlord. He's, yeah. He has made a commitment, a financial commitment to live in this place that he is not upholding, and that is not okay. A better gift, instead of paying his rent, would be to help him find a job and say, hey, I found seven places that are hiring, and here's the applications. Go do that, and go get some money so if you want to continue to live here. Yeah, but he won't do it. I mean, this guy, if it he, he like would have done it, he would have done kind it. Of, he's kind of a bum right now, and you know, at that age, you can sometimes fall into that slump mm -hmm. where you're just like, nah. I'm just a dude. I just don't want to work. I just don't feel like it. Don't want to flip burgers. Dude, he needs to get his mojo back. This other roommate that's not paying, and he he needs to do something about the situation. It's going to take a consequence, and that consequence is probably getting kicked out. Yep. Uh, the other thing to look into, Jennifer, when we talked about this lease thing is um, George was talking about getting out of the lease early. A lot of times if you break a lease early, there is some type of early, uh, you know, whatever fee. The fee might be one month's rent and your son's already paid that it may be worth it to your son to pay that fee which would have been just paying for the other roommate equivalent and then he's out of there he's done with these jokers that are a mess that aren't paying their bills and he can move on to find good roommates in a good place maybe live by himself oh my sounds gosh. like it'd be that a real, the dream. real gift at this point in his life he deserves it look into the details of the lease jennifer and um and i hope that helps thanks for calling this is the ramsey show Stop paying your overpriced wireless provider and switch to Pure Talk. They use the same network as the larger providers for much less. For just $30 a month, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data with no contract. The average family saves over $70 a month by switching to Pure Talk. Just go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless.
here at Ramsey Solutions, we're on a mission to transform so many lives that disruption spreads like wildfire. What does that mean? Well, just imagine a world where it's weird to have a student loan instead of everyone assuming that's the only way to get an education. Imagine a world where it's normal to pay cash for your car. Imagine a world where credit cards are the cigarette of the financial industry. Now imagine being a part of the team that's on a mission to make all that a reality through the work you do every day. At Ramsey Solutions, we have a thousand people working together to create digital products and services that will transform people's lives. Our goal is to disrupt the toxic money culture that exists in America today. If you want to join us on that crusade, we're on the hunt for software engineers with expertise in Ruby on Rails, Java, C Sharp, and front-end technologies. I don't know what any of that means, but if you do, this might be a job for you. Or if you're a UX designer, does that mean user experience? You nailed it. Nailed it. User experience. Process of deduction here. SEO and, I knew, no SEO. You know that one. Search engine optimization and content marketing specialist. We'd love to talk with you. Find out about all the available jobs by texting WORK to 33789. Text WORK to 33789 to find out about all of our open opportunities. We were just talking about this. Now is a great time for you to maybe think about doing something that means something to you. Maybe it's time for a job change, a career change. Maybe you work a J-O-B where you collect a paycheck and you're unhappy and you're unfulfilled. One of the things I talk about in my book, George, I walk through helping people discern what's matter and what matters to them, what's what right at the right time. But I give a recipe. In the middle of the book, I give a recipe for balance. I say, okay, regardless of your age or season, there are certain things you must have if you're going to feel balanced. For example, rest. Most people are trying to skimp on sleep. If you don't feel, if you don't get feel rested, if you don't have sleep, you're not creative, you've got health issues, you're not going to feel balanced regardless of how you manage your calendar. One of the other ingredients that I talk about in this section of the book is work that you enjoy. I don't care how you manage your time. If you spend 40 plus hours a week doing something that you hate, you're never going to feel balanced, much less happy. You have to align your time with things that make you come alive, that give you joy, that give you purpose, that give you meaning. This is what Ken Coleman talks about in his new book, Paycheck to Purpose. This is what I talk about in my book, Take Back Your Time. This is what we want to help you do. And by the way, we're hiring. We are a company that loves the work that we do. We genuinely believe in it. All thousand of us genuinely believe that our work matters, that we are changing lives. So if you want to be a part of that crusade, if you want to be a part of that mission, if you want to use your gifts, whether it is marketing or sales or all those words that I said, like C sharp and front end technologies, great. We need you. Text work to 33789. Our team will be in touch and hopefully we can find a spot for you. Lord knows we need the help because we got a lot of work mm-hmm. to do to fulfill that mission of disrupting the toxic money culture. All right, we're going to go to Autumn in Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, Autumn, how are you? Very good, thanks. Thank you for taking my call. Sure, what's going on? Yeah, I'm starting a small business and I was trying to find out and juggle whether or not you need a website or if a LinkedIn page is enough. Okay. To start out with, what's your what's your business idea? So it's writing um, documents, creating SOPs, manuals, training documents, uh, training presentations, and things like that. Cool. Uh, who is your ideal customer? Is this going to be a small business owner? Is this going to be um, who, who do you primarily want to work with for this? Would probably be biotech startups and the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Cool. So um, I think that at some point, yes, you need a website. I don't think out of the gate you need a website. Now, here's what's interesting. Okay. When you have a website, um, and when I say that you need it at some point, the reason I think you need it at some point is actually not to be found because I think most of your business is going to come through relationship building, through word of mouth marketing, through going to where your ideal client that you just described is building those relationships, showing them samples of your work, your portfolio, and so on. But because of the nature of your industry, there's an added expectation of credibility. It will make you seem more legit. 
to have a website. So, so okay. when I say I do think you need one at some point, similar to a graphic designer, a graphic designer needs a website, not because they're going to drive so much traffic there or people like, oh, I can only, you know, that's where they're going to get most of their customers. It actually doesn't do that. It just gives you an added layer of credibility that this person can design. Here's some samples of their work and so on. So I think it's more of the authority, trustworthiness, credibility in the nature of your industry that you're going into that you will need at some point. Do I think you need it out of the gate? No. I do think you need samples of your work to show that you have the skill okay. set to do what you want to do and fulfill the promise that you are, are are giving through this business. But I think most of it's going to come through relationship building, through networking, through LinkedIn, through people that you know, through getting your foot in the door through some of these companies and, uh, and just showing up. What do you think, George? Yeah. I know the website can be a hurdle for people, so I like to remove it when I can. 100%. And, uh, you know, I built my own website many moons ago as a musician, launching an album and all that stuff. And uh, the truth is there's just not, not going to be a lot of traffic there because there's not really a reason for people to go there. I'm not right. a blogger. And so really it's just a, it's a business card that's digital. Mm -hmm. And so you can do it easily yourself. If you just want to launch a Wix page in an hour over lunch, you can do that just where it has your information. But like Christy's saying, I want you to have the authority. And so that might mean a branded email that isn't, you know, uh, autumn at gmail.com, but it's autumn at your business name.com. And that then does tie into the website. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can literally just be really a clear, clear messaging. Um, and Donald Miller talks about this with his story brand stuff, but making it clear to a business owner who finds you about what you're all about. Don't get cute. Don't get clever. Here's what I do. I am in the technical writing space, and we do SOPs and training manuals for your business that will help you do X, Y, Z. And so you can go through that exercise to just craft a clear message on the website. It could be a Facebook page, whatever it is. But like Christy's saying, that's not what's important right now. What's important is that you start to form these relationships. Maybe that's on LinkedIn or in person, and you start to see what the competition is doing and start to get a feel for what it's going to be like to enter this space. The one thing I, one thing I want you to think about, Autumn, I I don't want you to go into the black hole of creating your website with a template like Wix or WordPress or whatever where you're like, oh, it's so easy. And then you end up going into this black hole and you're looking at widgets and there's all this dev, all those terms that you don't know what they mean. And you've spent a week trying to figure out what to do. And what it does is it kills your confidence because you think, I can't do this. I'm not good. I was never cut out for business in the first place, which is a very common thing that happens when people try to do their own website, even with the, the you know website in a box systems. The other thing is you might end up with a website, but it's really ugly and bad because you're not a web designer. You do what you do. And so it actually hurts your credibility because you put together something that sucks. I'd rather you have nothing than something that sucks until you can get something that's good. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. So, and, and I say this as someone who did exactly what I just described, George, back in the day when I became a certified business and life coach. This was even before I was doing it through our company. And I was like, I can do this. Sure. It's like you just get a template, right? And then like after a weekend, I wanted to throw my computer out the window. It yep. was so ugly. It looked so amateur. And I had wasted so much time. I was like, I can't even do this. I'm not even, I'm not even going to be able to do this, this side business. And the truth is it was just the website that was the hurdle. So I don't yep. want it to be something that keeps you from doing this because you're good at what you do and all that people care about is can you do what you say you can do and they're going to see that through samples if you've got some some companies you can work with put together a sample training manual for them with their business and their logo and their content what would you say and and deliver that with some coffee and donuts and get your foot in the door and I think those types of strategies are going to go further because just like George said no one's going to come to your website unless you send them there anyway and so it's not so much that it's driving traffic. It's just a source of credibility. It's a, it's a, I love how you said that digital business card. Oh, thank I you. I love that. Thank you. But it needs to look good. So until you're ready to make it look good, either with your skills or spending the money with someone that has those skills or bartering services, by the way, with someone that has those skills, there's creative ways to do it. Um, I think you can just build those relationships and get your business off the ground, get some cash in the door. And then when you're ready, you can cross that bridge when you get there. Great call. Great question. Good luck. By the way, this is The Ramsey Show.
Christy Wright, George Campbell, and I are taking your calls today at 888-825-5225. We love hanging out with you, and we want to talk about what you want to talk about here on The Ramsey Show. So money, life, business, and of course, time management as we celebrate the launch of my new book, Take Back Your Time. We are here for you. 888-825-5225. We're going to go to Zach in Grand Rapids. Hey, Zach, how are you? Hey, how's it going, guys? Great. What's going on? Yeah, I just had a quick question. So right now, my wife and I, were on baby step three, um, and she is about to finish nursing school at the end of the year. Um, so with that, our household income will almost double. Awesome. And yeah, so my question was, would it be smarter for us to, because we can live on just one, my income right now, how we are. Would it be smart for us to use her income and pay off our house early in like three or four years or just save it um, and have a bigger down payment for our next house? You know, I've, I've gotten this question before and there are some variables in terms of where you plan to move. But what's interesting is either way, it's going into the new house. You know what I mean? Like if you if you put the money on your house now, you've got more equity. If you save it for another house, the only difference is if you put it on the house now, you're saving a ton in interest especially over the course of three to four years. And you don't know when you're right. going to move. So I lean towards, yeah, paying off the house, get rid of that interest. Like, man, whenever our, you see that interest on your mortgage statement every month, that's just it so much money. It's so much money that you could get rid of or at least start chipping away at. Yeah. But either way, it's going to go towards that new house. Don't feel like it's instead of the new house. You know what I'm saying? If you decide to move, you've got that to put towards it. Yeah. My, my concern right. here, Zach, is are you, once you get through baby step three, we still have to invest... 15% of our household income into retirement. And so are you guys going to follow that plan? Yeah, yeah, we are. So we owe um, just about 100000 on our house. Um, so even us putting in 15% um, and all of that, I think that we'll be able to pay it off within three or four years. Cool. Well, that's awesome. That's so, awesome. Well, you're in baby step four, five, six land at that point, and whatever extra margin you have on top of investing for retirement, or if you have kids and uh, saving some for college, there, absolutely, that should go towards the house. And that's where I am right now. And I could be putting that money, like he's saying, Christy, in just a savings account. But here's the problem. Then it becomes a cookie jar, and you never know when you want to dip your hand in the cookie <laughs> jar because, you know what, the car is, we need a new car. We need a new so couch, tempting. and it becomes the everything fund. And so I like the forced savings plan of paying down the house. And honestly, it's such an incredible achievement that most Americans never do that I just want to see you guys pay off this house to say you did it. Yeah, that's awesome. Way to go. Way to go on doing so well to get to this point, paying off your debt and increasing the income. Congratulations to your, your wife and her new income, new job. So awesome. that's awesome. Well done. We love those calls. All right, let's go to Jordan in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Jordan, how are you? I'm all right. And how are y'all doing? Good. What's going on? Um, it's pretty hard to call in and even ask for help. But um, what Take is your time. message for what is your message for people who, like in my situation, um, we screwed up. We were Davis and just got ourselves in more trouble. And uh, I'm back on track personally. I'm I'm doing SPU again. I've got I pay for it. I'm watching the videos online, but and I'm doing my budget. We're 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 sticking to it right now. But it's so disheartening. Yeah. Um. And again, it's just it's, it's, there's a lot of pride. Just to even ask for help. Yeah. Um. But what is just the people in my situation? Well, Jordan. First of all, I want you to have some grace for yourself. We all screw up. I've screwed up. Georgia screwed up. Dave Ramsey has screwed up. He built this company that now is this big success that everybody looks at on a screw up, on going broke, bankrupt. He talks about remembering crying in the shower with a baby on the way, feeling exactly like you feel right now. So I just want you to know we all screw up and there's grace for you. We all do it. Tell me a little bit more about your financial situation, though, so George and I can give you more specific advice. When you say you made some mistakes, what are we looking at here in terms of debt? I know you're back into Financial Peace University, and you're ready to turn it around, and you need help, and I, and I hear you, and we want to help you, but can you tell me a little bit more about about the the details of your financial situation? 
Um, well, we're about seventy six thousand dollars in debt. We have, after budgeting, about sixteen hundred dollars to throw at debt. So, I mean, it's pretty good numbers when we're being disciplined. Um, the, the other part that's playing on this is that um, two years ago, when I first started at FPU and when I was day bench, whatever, I ended up losing my job and sold the house before I could lose that. And I've lived in a two car garage next to my parents since then. It floods every time it rains. I mean, I battle ants every day. I've got like three different columns of ants trying to get in right now. And it's taken a toll on my wife and I as marriage. But I mean, it's just the, the cheapest way we can live. So that way we can, you know, put money towards any form of debt. I mean, with the cheapest apartment we found around here is like 857 which, you know, with 1600 I guess it's okay. But still, that's, I, when you start talking about paying for trash and electric, I just don't think it's really doable. George, um, does your wife work? Yes, ma'am. She makes 41000 a year so as of today, actually. What's your, to- what's your total household income? Um, as of today, basically 120000 Okay. Jordan, listen to me. I want to tell you what I think is going on from my standpoint. You make $120,000. That's a great income. Mm -hmm. You have $76,000 in debt. Yeah, it's some debt, but you can get out of this. You can get out of this sooner than you think. What is absolutely wearing on your soul right now is where you're living in these freaking ants and the floods. It's killing your spirit. Get out. Get an apartment. You can afford an apartment. The four walls we tell you to take care of before any debt, one of them is your living, your your home, your housing. That is a priority before any of your payments. And I appreciate your dedication. And I know you feel sad and shame from making a mistake or being Davish, but you have gone so far that you are sacrificing your physical living situation. Your marriage is at risk. Your mental health is, is, is struggling because of this. What's killing your spirit is actually not your finances. Your finances are in a position to get yourself right on out of this. You have a great income. It's the ants. It's where you're living. George, am I missing something here? I mean, no. I feel like this, like. I, I think she's spot on. And, and Jordan, let me ask you this. Uh, let's say you get out and you're paying rent. That's going to change some things for you guys emotionally, right? Yes. You're going to have yes. some mojo back and go, oh my gosh. Yes. We don't have yes. to deal with the ant problem. I can go take on a side job and not come back yes. to this two car musty garage that we're living in. And what kind of debt is this? Um. So there's two credit card debts that were used to start a business that failed, um, and uh, there's hospital debt. Okay. And there's a car debt. Okay. So uh, is the car worth selling? Do you know what the car is worth versus what you owe on it? Uh, well, we just bought it several months back, well, in April. So it's about 40000 plus right now. If I was to sell it, it would probably still be maybe thirty grand if they give me anything for it. I mean, if I'm you, I'm getting rid of this car, and even if you're underwater, uh, I would take out a loan from the credit union or from a bank. That's the only time we tell you to do that is when you're underwater on that vehicle. But, man, that's going to give you some some uh, spirit back and actually make you feel like you can get this stuff done. It's going to make a huge dent in the debt. Yeah, that's half the debt right there. And then the medical debt, try to negotiate that down. Advocate for yourself, fight for this, see if they'll take less, uh, and try to settle on that for way less than that. Once you start doing these things, you're going to go, oh my gosh, I can see some light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not an oncoming train. Jordan, listen, you're going to sell this car, you're going to get an apartment, you're going to be in an awesome apartment, you're going to be in a better situation from a housing standpoint, you make $120,000 a year, and you're going to almost cut your debt in half if you do what we've just told you to do. That is going to lift your spirit, which is going to give you the momentum to tackle the rest of it. You have got this. You are in a better position than you realize. You just need to take hold of it. You got this. Thanks for calling. This is The Ramsey Show.
Our scripture of the day is 1 Peter 1, 6. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. It's a good word for our last caller and for any of you going through a hard season, maybe baby step two, feeling discouraged. There is joy ahead. Alexander Graham Bell said, when one door closes, another opens, but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one that has opened for us. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that um, we had in our last call with Jordan that I, we didn't have time to talk about, but I thought was interesting is he said, I had two businesses that failed that wrong credit cards. And one of the things I've seen, George, is sometimes people, because of a wound, because of shame, because of a failure or, or perceived failure, uh, it can get us so down that we feel like we can't get up. Yeah. We feel like we can't try again because we're down. We're discouraged, man. Our, our heart's been broken. You know, and I, I know a ton of people whose business is closed because of the pandemic and they could have restarted. Maybe those industries are open again. The regulations are down. Uh, but it just, it killed their spirit. And I hate to see that. One of the things I, I, I love that we try to do for you guys here on the Ramsey show is just reignite hope. That's what we do. Yes. Give you hope again. Yeah. Shame and guilt can just take over mm-hmm. and you just can't see a way out. Mm-hmm. And so our job is to just help you go, no, there's a way out. Yeah. There's a door there. There's a door there. You have options. That's right. You're not painted into a corner. And just to give people a little bit of that encouragement that they can they can find progress. They can find hope. It doesn't have to be this way. Stay this way. And so I love that call with Jordan, not because of a situation, but just because I love showing people, too, you're not – it's not as bad as you think. Right. And you're going to be out of this sooner than you think if you do this stuff with a gazelle intensity like we teach. And you're going to be at a place where you are. You look back and you go, wow, look what God did. Look yeah. where God took me from That's where right. I was to where I am today. Right. And it's gazelle intense, but it's not cats and ants and floods. No. It's like what you're Goodness, looking, he's dealing with a plague. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, we want you to take care of you. But I love that reminder. We do. We want to give you guys the hope that you can do it. We want to help you believe that you can do it because you can't and then show you how to do it with the practical, tactical baby steps. That's what we're here for. 888 825 George Campbell and I are taking your calls and we're going to go to L.A. We've had a lot of L.A. calls today with Art. Hey, Art, how are you? Hey there, y'all. I'm doing good. How about yourself? Great. What's going on? Hey, so... um. To get started, you know, I'm a, full, I'm a full-time student. I'm a full-time worker. I'm about to hit my mid-20s. And the issue, but not a crazy issue, is I still live with my folks. Um, I decided to move out at 18, but for some reason I wanted to take care. We had a bad relationship, so I just wanted to take care of that before moving on. And things are better now, you know, thank God. But um, the issue is that, you know, they receive government benefits, and uh, I'm feeling a sense of guilt and worry that if I leave, uh, you know, they might have, they're kind of in their 60s. I don't want them working to an early grave while I'm out there taking care of myself. But I kind of have to move out in the sense that I need to start my financial independent life as well as still help them to enjoy their uh, their golden age. So I'm kind of stuck between, like, I want I want to start my life I've already delayed it just so I can help them. I want to start my life, but I feel guilty for leaving. And um, I guess right now that's just the general gist of it. Hmm. Well, this is this is interesting. I, I first of all, I love your heart that you care about your parents, and that comes through even in your question. And you wanted to repair any parts of the relationship that needed to be repaired. Tell me a little bit about what the conversations with your parents are like. What is the expectation? What are you, how are you taking care of them financially now? What do they expect? Is there an expectation that you are going to stay there for a lot longer? What, what have these conversations been like up to this point? Um, well, the conversations have been almost non-existent. You know, they don't really usually end well, so I just try to avoid them. But usually, I mean, I'm Eastern European, so I mean, I'm sure... Uh, a lot of people don't understand, you know, uh, the the general idea is that you stay with your folks until you're married. Yeah. And uh, it's a cultural thing. Know, but yeah, it's a cultural yeah. thing. Personally, I've I've always been had an independent streak, so I think my folks are kind of they'll just go along with what I go with. But um, but yeah, it really just depends on me. Like regardless of the culture, their expectations, you know, I listen. Like I, I always have an ear open for them, but. I, I'm at the point where, you know, it's also my life that I'm responsible for, not them, not anybody else, just me. So if I leave, I'll, then they'll, they'll accept that. If I don't, they'll accept that. Uh, but 
expectation wise and conversations wise, I'd say my um there's always like a nervousness in my mother's tone in regards to finances, just the worries and that's all it is really, like the worries, the worries, the worries of what's gonna happen next, where they're gonna leave, what's gonna happen with them. So uh I don't think she does this intentionally, but her worrying kind of puts like this uh like uh, I wouldn't say guilt, but just I worry too, you know? Yeah, like an unspoken um, I, pressure. I, yeah. yeah so exactly. How are you supporting them? What do you mean by I'm supporting them financially? Are you giving them money every month as rent? Yeah, I'm keeping with them, helping them with their bills, just personal things. Like, just honestly, just whatever, just trying to take care of them the best I can. So uh, are you paying them bills for them? Money. Uh, I'm paying most of them. I'm paying most of them. I'm paying about 70% of the bills. Wow. Now, this is so you're not paying rent, but you're basically covering their life. Oh no, I'm also paying the rent as well as the other the other our other bills. Okay, so this is a very different situation. How much are you giving them a month total? Would you say, including bills uh, and rent? Like, like minimum a grand a month, but like I usually like throw them like a couple hundreds extra. So we can say like thirteen hundred, twelve hundred. And are they able to work? How old are they? Um. Uh, well. My, well, my mother is, um, I think, in her mid fifties. Uh, so she, so, and my uh, my father uh, got cancer in the early two thousands. So uh, he wasn't, he hasn't been able to work for a while. He he, he physically so can't the, work because of that. Yeah, so it's just been me and her. Is he on any kind of disability? Does he get any income currently? Yeah, he does. But, you know, it's not. It's 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 good. It's not. It's not a crazy amount, but like it's it's good for what it is. I'm curious how we got to this point that you're paying all the bills. There, I know y'all. It sounds like y'all are not a family that communicates a whole lot. You said the conversations are kind of non-existent; they don't end well, so you avoid them. I, I've seen those family dynamics. I know what you're talking about. But something happened to the point where you started paying those bills. How did those conversations go? How did we get to this point where you're paying seventy percent of their expenses? Well, it's just kind of what I wanted to do. I figured, like, it's the bare, it's the least I could do for them, you know, all the things I put them through. Just, uh, yeah, I just started when I first got you my first well-paying job. Yeah, let me put, put this. Why not? Okay. Let me put this scenario in. What if they live another, I mean, they're they're young, truthfully. Uh, what if they live another 20 years and they're expecting you to pay 70% of their bills? His mom's 50. They could would live a lot longer than that. So I'm just wondering, there, there doesn't seem like there's a way out here. I think you guys need to have a hard conversation about an exit strategy. And you need to say, hey, in six months, I'm going to move out, and I want to make sure you guys are taken care of, and this is not a, a battle where I want to leave you guys in a lurch. This is me saying I need to live my life, and I want to make sure you guys are taken care of. And you help them develop a plan for what that looks like for them to cover their own bills. And that might mean mm. mom needs to go back to work. It might mean dad needs to find something he can do remote on a computer or whatever his health maybe allows him to do. Maybe it, it means looking to make sure they have the right – insurance in place to protect them. And so I think you can help set them up without enabling them and paying bills for the rest of your life as you try to start your adult life. Well, and it, and it sounds like that that's what you you want to be independent, Art. And so what's keeping you there is not a desire. I, I hear your heart that you want to take care of them. And, and I love what, exactly what George said, where you're going to have a conversation that's going to be an exit strategy that's going to be gradual over time so that you can pursue your independent financial life and independent life. And also help assist them, make sure they're okay and they, they are able to be self-sufficient. I want to acknowledge one thing. Your mom's 50. She's young. She's young. She can work. She might not want to work, but if they don't have income, she needs to work. Someone needs to be working so that they have income to take care of themselves and it's not all on you. I love your heart. But it's not all on you, and, and that's not sustainable long term as well. That's just, um, you know that. And so exactly like George said, you start working on an exit strategy and bring them into the conversation. Hard and awkward, awkward conversations, but you need to have them. All right, I want to thank my co-host George Camel, producer James Childs, associate producer Austin Selby, and you, America, for tuning in. This is The Ramsey Show. Have a friend or family member that needs a 
daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.